In this Climate Gen episode, I speak with Roger Hallam, original co-founder of Extinction Rebellion, Just Stop Oil, and other socially focused organizations. He also hosts the Designing the Revolution podcast. Roger's communication style is often confrontational and very direct. In this interview, Roger discusses where he thinks we are now and the complex sociological processes at work that will determine the future. Moving into 2024, we are faced with the reality that the largest fossil fuel producers are expanding production around the world, demonstrating disregard for all the scientific warnings and broken promises that litter the decades since the 1970s regarding our overconsumption and carbon pollution. The COP process of the last eight years from Paris to Dubai is documented in my book Cop Out, which is available to pre-order on Amazon now. Endorsements from key people involved in confronting climate and ecological issues are included in the notes. This year I will be focusing on speaking with people who articulate the myriad pathways forward from the social, political, natural and technological options and their inevitable pitfalls. The objective is to see what we can learn and improve our chances for a better outcome than what we currently face. Thank you to all supporters who make this series possible. Please do subscribe, share the episodes or do whatever you can to be part of the conversation. I do try to read as many comments as possible. Thank you. Roger, thank you very much for taking the time. I want to start really where we are now. It's, it's sort of January 2024. It's 30 years on from the Rio Earth Summit. Governments have pursued failure to reduce emissions pretty much as a policy. And today, the fossil fuel industry with host governments are planning massive expansion while Earth systems are failing, conflict rises, fascism is pretty much becoming mainstream. So from your perspective, where do we go from here? Well, that's a nice, easy question, isn't it, for us to start off with? Yes, well, I think at least as as far as I'm concerned, I have good reason to think this is a feeling across the sort of resistance spaces, is that we've passed a point where we can't be arguing that we need to stop the climate crisis. We need to be saying, and we are saying, I suppose, the climate crisis is now locked in. And the question is how bad it will be and what the social implications of that will be. And I think the main thing that I'm trying to communicate is that there's rather self-serving binary between, oh, everything's going to be fine. You know, the powers that be will sort it out. And, oh, that's it, you know, Puff, the human race is gone. That's really not that accurate or responsible. I think what we're basically looking at is a period of massive social and political disruption. And there's no particular determinacy about what the outcome of that will be. And that's quite interesting um, in the sense that, you know, there's no question that the default historically when societies enter into existential risk or periods of when their very existence is under threat, they tend towards authoritarianism. But at the same time, there's also plenty of historical examples where that triggers revolutionary episodes that creates a massive surge of progressive development in a society as well. And sometimes both, of course. <laughs> so the people that get really deterministic about it, saying it's over, you know, we're all going to die. And, you know, it's just convenient excuse not to think in the same way as, oh, it's going to be fine as a convenient excuse not to think. And as we've discovered over the last 30 years, human beings aren't that great at thinking, you know, <laughs> when their fundamental, you know, securities are threatened. So for me, it's it's a big opportunity for progressive movements broadly defined to start defining programmes and strategies that remove the present carbon regime and replace it with something else. And that's what we need to think about. Okay. And how much traction, I know you've been doing podcasts and lots of other engagement activities. How much traction do you get across the activism space and with other groups in different regions and so on to make a broader conversation i think to be honest with you the broader conversation is stuck (laughs) 
and for reasons which are quite understandable from a sociological point of view. I think as you approach a time of revolutionary change or massive social disruption, there's a sort of darkness before dawn syndrome where instead of it increasing conversational plurality, people double down on their various prejudices and desires not to actually confront what's going on. I mean, not exclusively as well, but I think it's important to acknowledge that dynamic. And what that means is it's possible nothing will happen until there'll be a massive disruption. And this is one of the big problems with the liberal perspective, which we've all inherited, you know, from the past 30 years, which is, oh, next year things will start happening and things will gradually improve, right? That's the general narrative uh, in the liberal progressive space. But there's not much historical evidence for that. Most societies, you know, remain in denial about a big threat and even double down on that denial. And then the shit hits the fan and everything changes in four weeks. I mean, the classic example is 1939 with, you know, the Munich conference and then the invasion of Poland. You know, if you can study the late 30s, you can see something extremely similar to what's happening now, which is a desperation to believe that Hitler was just a petty nationalist, when all the evidence, he was a psychopath, he was out to destroy European civilization. And of course, the situation now is even more obvious because we're talking about physics rather than the interpretation of a dictator's program, as you might say. But I don't think human beings particularly, you know, as a general rule, respond until it's right in front of them what's going on. And that, by saying that, I'm not saying that therefore all is lost by any means. What I'm saying is, is history progresses through ruptures rather than progressive gradualism as a general rule. And the, the problem is we've had 30 years of gradualism. So everyone in my generation, your generation, still thinks, you know, we're all encultured into thinking, oh, we're, things will gradually start getting better. You know, people respond to the climate emergency. Well, what's more likely to happen is, dare I say, it, five million people in South Asia will suddenly die in four weeks from, you know, extreme temperatures, and then all hell will break loose. That's a far more viable prediction, I think. Yeah, but then we had these sort of floods in Pakistan, which I, I mean, for me, I'd never quite seen anything like that a couple of years ago, and no one really batted an eyelid. And in fact, it wasn't really put on the mainstream media very much and it's almost like we just blank these things out if if the five million deaths happen to be in Europe then perhaps that would be a more a sort of cataclysmic event that would stop people in their tracks in this region for example well I, well I think I think I know this is a gruesome thing to talk about but I'm just talking about it sociologically and politically is Again, if you go back to the 1930s, like after the Munich conference, it was really bad, but everyone was still in denial. Even though objectively, I think the Czech Republic had just been, you know, sliced up a bit or something. It wasn't until the invade of Poland. I think what, what you have to understand is the tipping point between a global denial and a global panic is very narrow. And I think the determining factor is death. Five million people dying will definitely create a global panic right? because nothing like that's happened be before, as opposed to a third of a country, you know, being flooded. And I know that sounds ridiculous. And I think you're totally right. You know, I mean, 20,000, what, 10, 15, 20,000, depending who you talk to, died in Libya, right? But if that, if that happened in the Po Valley, you, that would be the end of the carbon regime in Europe. I mean, that's that's what I think is, it, you know, not definitely, but it'd be on the cards. There'd be a massive wave of panic. And I think panic is what it's all about, right? You know, actually, when people say existential risk, right, it doesn't really mean anything, does it? You know, it's like, oh, well, there we are. That's Nick Breeze talking about existential, you know, problems. When people actually think, fuck, I am going to die, that's a totally different kind of fish. You see what I mean? Or my pension has now gone that's a that's def that's totally different so we have to understand you can have a country which has a, a crisis of five out of ten five out of ten six out of ten and then seven out of ten triggers a revolution 
it doesn't need to be that much greater. Okay. And you said recently, I can't remember where it was, but the, the regime will collapse under the weight of its own contradictions. And part of me thought, well, what if it doesn't? What if it just keeps bumbling on and collapsing at the edges? And then you've mentioned a cataclysmic event which which could change things. But what if the activism itself gets uglier? Now, you've always said, and not everyone really does say, that you know, these are non-violent protests, etc. But is there a line where that changes? Sorry, there's two questions there. What's the first one? Well, the first one is, if the situation doesn't collapse under the weight of its own contradictions, because the contradictions, you're right, they, they are everywhere now across our society. Yeah, 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 yeah. What, 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 say- what I'm saying by that is not some abstract, abstract, oh, you know, a regime has got contradictions. I mean, all... All regimes have contradictions. What I'm saying is, when the con- contradictions are such that there's a there's a fiscal crisis of the state, as the phrase I like to use, which comes from the sociology of revolution, where and that's that that literature is, as I understand it, is basically saying there's a point at which you can say with almost certain certainty a regime is going to collapse. So, for instance, like. You know, six weeks before the calling of the Estates General in, in before the French Revolution, the French king was told that the the country was going to go bankrupt in six weeks. So this was a crisis that had been accumulating for 10, 20 years, you know, arguably. And everyone knew objectively, or not everyone knew, but objectively, it was going to happen. It was coming along the, the line. But they denied it because of the power of absoluteness and what have you know. If you say something unpleasant to the king, he gets rid of you and all that business. So that's what I mean by the collapse of a regime. Or similarly, you know, the Tsar in 19, you know, 16, 1917, he was determined to continue the war. If he continued the war, then the Russian state was going to collapse. So what I'm saying is, is there'll be a climate crisis which will intersect, obviously, with existing social crises, which make it impossible for the regime to maintain legitimacy. And people think, oh, you know, that's not going to happen. But it happens all the time, right? You know, this is what I've been saying to people. Every, you know, 30, 50, 70 years, every Western Western state of the last 300 years has had an existential crisis, you know, disease, war, you know, environmental crisis. So we shouldn't be surprised there's nothing metaphysically constant about Western liberal democracies. <laughs> you know, the, the historical entities, you know, they'll they they will disappear at some point and something else will emerge for better or worse. But isn't that the point now is that a lot of people are actually anticipating problems because the warnings are consistently denied. I mean, even ten years ago we thought we'd never be in this position now with emissions still rising we, we thought the governments would make structural changes they haven't they've doubled down and so my second question was that is there a point where activism says we can't take this anymore and we have to we have to forcibly well, let, let, prescribe if you don't mind, let me just come to back to that idea that 10 years ago we were saying oh you know governments were going to take action they didn't i think it's completely respectable say that the regimes of the world weren't going to i think the problem was that the voices that were saying that were few and far between and they certainly weren't given any publicity but it, it's entirely possible for regimes to design their own suicide in fact that's a regular event throughout history regularly engaging activities that guarantees their own collapse that's why they collapse and what we can see now you know, depending on who you talk to, if we're going to stay under two degrees or 1.5, what are we looking at? A global reduction in carbon emissions of 9% for 1.5, let's say 7 for the sake of argument for 2. The COVID pandemic was a 4% reduction. So we need to do two COVID reductions every year for the next X years. There's no regime in the world that's going to do that. And the reason is, is because if they did, they would get overwhelmed by the reaction to it by people on the right. And this is the conundrum of the regimes historically, is they're in a bind. If they do what is rationally necessary, then they will collapse because they get overwhelmed by 
particular interests within the political class. If they don't, they will collapse because of objective factors, right? There's no money, or they've lost the war, or you see, you see what I mean? So this is what I'm saying is, we don't want to say 100%, but we, we can say with effective certainty, in 10 years' time, there won't be liberal democracies in the present form in the Western world. You know, maybe 15, maybe next year, right? We don't know. But it's in that sort of ballpark. As you start heading towards two degrees, there's going to be major events. So that's one side of the equation. The other side of the equation is what you're asking is, what is the the degree of agency for the resistance movements and what would they do or should they do? And obviously there is the historical default, as it were, is people move towards terrorism and then they move towards mass movements that are violent and then there's revolutions and then you get totalitarian violent regimes, right? That's entirely possible. Uh, That's the first thing to say. As far as whether that should happen, absolutely not, (laughs) in my view, because, you know, apart from the common sense problems with that, the historical evidence is, you know, last 100, 200 years, just about all violent rebellions have resulted in chronic civil wars or totalitarian regimes within five years. So this is what I'm saying to, you know, the sort of how to whatever it's called, how to blow up a pipeline sort of lobby in so much as it exists, which I think is mainly a media phenomenon, dare I say it. <laughs> you know, it's like the liberal elites engaging a bit of masochism. But, you know, at worst, it's just going to get lots of people beaten up and put into prison and killed. And at best, it will lead to the breakdown of societies into civil war. Because as we all know, you know, there's massive movements on the other side of the equation. And there's nothing more that fascists love than having war and violence, right, and the state. So you're just being a bit dumb, to be honest with you, apart from it being problematic, ethically, let's put it like that. And Mm -hmm. and the point point I'm I'm trying to make, so I'm not saying, therefore, it's all, you know, all just go home and wait for it to happen. I think there's an awful lot that can be done. In fact, the major sort of social project of the present time is to build the infrastructure of resistance so that as and even when these shocks happen and there's an, a fluidity in society, then the groups that are best organised can potentially take over the state. So for me, that's the strategy rather than um, violence or, or passivity. Okay. And on a scale of one to ten, how organised are you at the moment? Two. Two. <laughs> <laughs> very good and um but in the in organizing or even trying to execute any kind of resistance the system inevitably doubles down it comes back and it defends itself and we're seeing that in the uk now with many activists getting very heavy sentences and basically facing a very unjust judiciary can you talk a little bit about your experience of it and also how that fits into this, because that's obviously a massive... We we do describe the judiciary as being a tool for for climate action. Well, the judiciary, you know, has got the potential, basically, to break the system, because it's the part of the governmental space which isn't sort of bound into this herding mechanism, you know, that the politicians won't reduce carbon emissions because they'll lose the vote and people, you know, won't vote for it because there's no politicians that will do it. You know, I mean, who's going to rapidly reduce carbon emissions in the next election? Green Party and a good day, but they're not going to get in. You know, you see what I mean? So you're into this suicidal herding dynamic between the different elements. What the judiciary in principle can do is say, we represent the British crown, the state rather than the regime. And this is an important distinction. I'm always talking to police about this. You know, they take a oath to the crown and say, oh, we can't do anything because they're taking an oath to the crown and saying, Yeah, you can. You can stop treason. That's the whole point of taking, you know, if the regime starts killing lots of people in the north of England, you're not going to go, well, that's all right. Then you're going to go, well, we have an oath to the British crown and we're not going to destroy British society for you, regime X, you know. And that's what the generals said to Trump, you know, they said, 
Well, with due respect, we're not going to defend your regime because our oath is to the American Constitution, not to any particular president. You see what I mean? This is a very important constitutional and political political point. So in principle, there's nothing stopping the judiciary going, excuse me, but there's overwhelming evidence that if the British state continues to max out on oil and gas, then in 2030, 40 times, we won't have a British state or anymore, and therefore it's treasonous. And therefore, we refuse to convict people who are actually protesting or resisting that eventuality, right? But, you know, we know we know that's very difficult because, <laughs> you know, it requires a judiciary that's got some backbone. And the one thing the British judiciary doesn't have is backbone because arguably people haven't been shot in wars, you know, in the last generation. To me, it's interesting that, have you seen the film, a film about the Pentagon Papers and the Washington Post? Have you seen that film? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that, that generation had all fought in World War II. So they knew what defending democracy looked like. And they were prepared to expose the Nixon government and all the, you know, the government's lying to the American public. And there was no question they should have gone to prison, right? <laughs> you know, that was a state secret, but they did it anyway, because they believed democracy was, was uh, you know, they were prepared to go to prison. Unfortunately, this is a major, major problem. The liberal space got no backbone, and that's probably the most disappointing reason why we're failing at the present moment is I'm sure you've interviewed lots of people like this who go, yes, yes, Nick, you know, it's terrible, isn't it? It's terrible, it's terrible. And no, I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to put, put my status and my liberty on the line. And what it's left to is ordinary people around the country to do so. And as for your question, you know, what does that do? Well, again, you know, dare I say, the answer is, is it could go either way. <laughs> you know, it's oh. indeterminate. There's very little evidence that says, oh, if you repress people, you always win. Basically, it's like throwing a dice. You know, society is a complex system. If you engage in the repression of a population, two things can happen. One, you win. You know, everyone, you know, everyone just gets decimated. Or there's a tipping point and everyone says, fuck that, we're going out on the street and we're not, and we're not leaving. And my more nuanced sort of analysis of that is that will happen when the climate movement, and this is a major strategic move, when the climate movement fuses with other movements that are generally rising up against the climate austerity regime and the fusion between those two. Because I think what we're seeing now, and we certainly will over the next five to 10 years, is the logic of austerity, the logic of making the poor pay for the mistakes of the rich will fuse with the rich trying to impose the cost of the transition onto the poor. And you can see that's going in a right with that. That produces people moving towards fascism. But it needn't. It could move or simultaneously can move towards people going, we've had enough, you know. Uh, and it's not people will come out on the streets about saying we've had enough not under a sort of liberal climate frame. They're going to come out saying we've had enough of the whole fucking situation, you know, and the rich need to pay. In other words, it's a, it'll be a classical frame, which is the rich need to pay, which is what the main, that's been the main frame for the last 200 years, for obvious reasons, you know. <laughs> and is that the inflection point where you, where you think the sort of, for one of another, whatever word is a revolution, reform, or change will will occur. Well, you just can't say. All you can say is is you that enables you to throw a dice. You see what I mean? If if you just do a, a to B marches, do petitions, you know, come and do interviews with guys like you, no disrespect, you know, then that's all. That's well and good, you know. It's all well and good, but it's not going to enable you to throw a dice. If you want to throw the dice, then you have to have a critical mass of civil resistance, which, you know, to put some numbers on it, requires like 10,000 people being in the street for three or four weeks. It's, I mean, the tipping point is not that high, as we saw in the Netherlands, like in September, right? There was 25,000 arrests, wasn't it? Something like that, over four weeks. And, it, and, and the government cracked. So that's what I've been saying for seven years is, it, it doesn't take a lot of people. And arguably, with just the point of what I've been trying to say is that the tipping point is actually quite low because 
particularly with the police, they've so been so abused and humiliated and exploited by the government, you know, since the beginning of austerity. It won't wouldn't take a lot for some of the police to say, actually, that's not our problem. <laughs> like the Dutch police said, it's not our problem. You know, I don't know if you saw the statement the unions put out. They said, what we want to do is catch criminals. We don't want to be dragging thousands of people off the road, with all due respect. That's the politicians. The politicians should come in down and sort you out. So the police aren't necessarily saying, hey, we're great. You know, we love climate protesters. What they're saying is, is sort it out, right? It's a political problem. And that's happened over and over and over again, historically, with the defection of the police. But, you know, it, there's no guarantee. I mean, you don't know quite how it's going to pan out. So, it could, you know, it could all collapse or it comes, and then it comes back three, three years later. And I want to come back again to impacts that we're starting to experience, certainly all over the world, even in the Northern Hemisphere now. And we're definitely going to start seeing they interact with things like conflict and so on. At this COP, I mean, it was a massive failure, whatever you want to call that side of it. But I was quite amazed in both the blue and the green zone by the the number of geoengineering events. If you were back at COP21, there was nothing. I mean, no one, people would have scorned such a thing. What's your sort of viewpoint on this discussion? Because it's now becoming a greater conversation. I think Jason Box, in a, when I spoke to him recently, said it's an inevitable conversation, whereas other scientists were saying, we shouldn't be researching or we should shut this conversation down. So what would you say your thoughts are on this? Yeah, it's very interesting in a morbid sort of way, isn't it? You know, it, it, you know my expertise in, is in social dynamics and organising people, right? So I'm when I'm looking at what's happening, then I'm taking my lead from people like you and the interviews that you do and, you know, the statements of scientists. And, you know, I do that all the time, I'm sure as you do, you know, four or five articles a day I look at. And, you know, you don't need to be a genius to work out that we've passed a tipping point where we are already going to go over two. And if we go over two, we're going to go over three. And if we go over three, we're going to go over four. Now, we're not saying that's absolutely the case, but I think if you are going to be coolly rational about it, you'd be saying that is that is now the main scenario. And I know there's massive repression around that because people don't accept it. It's a domino dam dynamic rather than a sequential dynamic. You see what I mean? It's like people go, oh, we're going to reach free. Well, that doesn't that statement doesn't make any sense because if you reach free, obviously you're going to go to four. Uh, you know, this is quite cognitively complicated, but it's not rationally complicated. It's like in the same way as a domino, you know, you look at a domino and say, no way is that going to hit the fifth domino. But it is, isn't it? Because it knocks over one which knocks over the second. So there's a big sort of willful sort of confusion around that. Well, if that's the case, then, and it is the case, uh, or at least how I would frame it, is that is the main scenario, then is a no-brainer that we need to do geoengineering. Now, as I've always said, is if you know if there's some engineering genius out there that can come up with something that involves, you know, growing sea campus or something, then it's a no-brainer that you use natural, low-risk, low-risk sort of methodologies to reduce carbon in, into the atmosphere. It's not my patch, but what I do know with absolute certainty is if it comes down to the collapse of civilization or geoengineering, it's a no-brainer which one is going to be chosen or which one should be chosen. Now, it is something of an open question, I think, whether regimes are going to be clever enough to actually engage in that, because there could be a, you know, there could be a collective action problem around geoengineering. <laughs> uh, and there could be fascist regimes that just want to deny it altogether. So people really shouldn't assume that it's obvious. But the main debate is that the main debate is the moral hazard problem, isn't it? Which is, oh, if you say there's going to be needs to be geoengineering, then that's that lets off the, you know, the fossil fuel industry. And, you know, that's a big concern. But the problem with all major, you know, critical paradigm changes is they all everything all has moral hazard. And you just have to take the hit. 
if you see what I mean. Like if you're going to have a big change in technological approach or or in terms of policies, there's always going to be unintended consequences of it. So as far as I'm concerned, you know, the programme for the next 10 years is massive reduction in carbon emissions, massive investment in geoengineering and earth repair and a revolution. And all those three things are interlinked. You, you see, you see what I mean. That's what I. That's that's my position. <laughs> and the moral hazard. We were talking about it over a decade ago, and and unfortunately, it doesn't matter because <laughs> the moral has. There is no morals on the other side anyway. So the whole thing is completely continued unabated. And I think most people call for research, but not deployment. But quite a few people I've spoken to who are sort of in that field say, well, research has to be deployed to a certain scale to see if it actually works. And then if you're just researching and say, okay, we don't think this is going to work, but then you have a massive um, impact, a very bad impact, a bit on the sort of COVID-19 scale. Well, one thing we, we do know then is that science kicked in and needed to respond because politicians needed to respond, everybody needed to respond. And whatever's developed could find its way to being deployed, even if it wasn't properly tested. I think that it is such a complex thing. And some of the arguments out of COP, of this recent COP, were coming from the global south in favor of geoengineering. And they were kind of inverting all the old arguments, saying to take it off the table is again the global north deciding what's best for us who are right in the line of um, hurricanes which are destroying today our mm. prospects for the future and so on and so forth i think the climate you know the climate space generally is, is full of what i would call sort of hyper rationalists right they think the world is the same as them that so everyone sits down and they look at the stats and then they make a rational decision there's two problems with that one is it's self-decepting because rationally scientists aren't actually that rational, right? <laughs> as has been often shown. And secondly, the rest of the world certainly isn't rational in that way. So like the biggest challenge really for the liberal scientist space is to understand sociology, because what they do is they take the guiding sort of frame of the present regime, which is that change is gradual, it's rational, and we'll, we'll soon be getting on with it. All those three things are incorrect. They're not sustainable. It's 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 as it's as intellectually insustainable as saying the Arctic isn't going to melt. You know, the Antarctic is fine, and there's no methane coming out of the wetlands. If you said that to a bunch of scientists, they think you're totally in denial. But as a sociologist, what I'm saying to scientists is, if you think change is gradual, you don't know what you're talking about. If you think the change is going to come from the present regime, you don't know what you're talking about. You see what I mean? Which isn't saying it's impossible, but it's just not, it's illiterate, sociologically illiterate. And scientists endlessly, wittingly or unwittingly, reinforce the existing regime in its widest sense by just trotting out sociology that they don't know anything about. You know, like in the articles, they go, oh, you know, you know, you know the standard article. Here's a new bit of research. We were very surprised. It's going to cause loads of problems and policymakers should take, you know, notice. I mean, it could be written by an AI program, right? It's the same structure over and over again. But the last bit is not science. The last bit is political opinion. When you say, and policymakers should engage in X, Y, and Z, what you're saying is, is policymakers will act and they can act. Well, both of those things are disputable. In fact, that's ridiculous because they're not going to because of the collective ac action problem. You, you see what I mean? So for me, like the big debate for scientists is not should we, you know, should we do a little bit of geoengineering and then roll it out as if we're in perfect political conditions. The big debate for scientists is when they're going to come out and say, revolutionary change is now necessary in carbon regimes in order to get a regime which will act rationally. You see what I mean? No one, no one's saying that apart from, you know, James Hansen on a good day about the younger generation. 
that that's the moral and intellectual challenge for the climate space, particularly the intellectual sort of guys that you tend to interview. And I think you should challenge them and say, where's your sociology? You know, where's your where's your political analysis there? It's, it's just not credible. Okay. And this is really to finish on <laughs> as we as we steer our way into the 2024 and you've talked about the, the conversation that needs to happen, the questions <laughs> I should be asking. So on and so forth. Yeah, yeah. Trying to get you to write, make some notes there for <laughs> I'm recording. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> what are the events this year where these, these are on your sort of radar, where these conversations can take place? Are they taking place? Is there anything we can do to make them take place? To be honest with you, I think there's just this big block going on. There's a big block. There's a big block because people don't want to, in the climate space generally, people don't want to acknowledge that a liberal paradigm has failed, but they know it has subliminally or subconsciously. So they're in some massive cognitive dissonance. And it's going to be very difficult for them to break through that. So I don't, I'm not optimistic about the liberal climate space at all. Um, I mean, you know, people will dribble out of it, you know, you'll give me an interview, things like that, you know what I mean? But it's very difficult to break herding spaces without an objective material crisis. But outside that herding space, there's loads of things happening. You know, like 90% of the British population doesn't agree with the existing constitutional arrangements. You know, the, the trust in politicians is at the lowest point since whenever, you know, 1750 or something, you know what I mean? It's, it's off the scale, but none of that shows in the existing political, liberal, neoliberal public space. I won't get invited onto Newsnight, you see what I mean? Not because what I'm saying is irrational, but because it's too challenging. So I think what the biggest challenge is for the climate resistance space, which is separate from the liberal space, right, to fuse itself with with the general potential for social disruption coming through the social question as much as the climate question, you know, the cost of living crisis and all this sort of stuff. And if that fusion can come together and the basic demand will be for a change in the political system, that's the demand. And the frame is going to be political corruption and the political class. And that's why the climate is a problem. You see what I mean? The climate won't be foregrounded. The political class and its corruption is going to be foregrounded. And at the moment, that hasn't got itself quite coordinated, that structural move. But I think in the resistance space around the world, there'll be a move away from, you know, hey, we've got a problem with the climate. Do you think there'll you know, be more about all, linkages? Yeah, because, oh, we've got a problem with the climate from a radical point of view, is a corporate frame. You know, it's, we've all been duped for 30 years because we were persuaded to talk about the climate as if it was a technical problem, when all the time it was basically a problem of political corruption and political power in the classical frame, right, of the narrative of the last 300 years, you know, that the rich guys are running the show, they shouldn't be because they're doing us in. That's that's always been the frame, and that's that's the frame that will bring about the structural change. And when you say, well, why, how is it going to do you in? Well, because they keep nicking our money and they're going to put carbon into the atmosphere and kill us all. So we need to get rid of the political class. It, that's that's the 10 second version, which is very different from, oh, we've got a problem with the climate. We need to do a few technical things. <laughs> that's that's the uh, transition. Yeah. And, I, and, and, you know, just for the record, I would dearly love, because I'm sure many of the people listening to this podcast will be in this group, you know. I would dearly love for all those professional liberal people who've got you know plenty of respect for, you know, they, they're very intelligent and ethical people. But my challenge to them is they're engaging in in a you know world Alice in Wonderland fantasy world if they think the cops or the governments are going to respond. They're not. It's just not sustainable. And they, they need to look at themselves in the mirror and go, am I going to continue being a dick? <laughs> or am I going to actually move out of that space and move into a resistance space? And if 1% of them do, then we may win. And if they don't, we may well lose. 
that's my challenge too. Okay, on that note, thank you very <laughs> much. It's been great to speak to you. With the, with yeah, well, thank you so much for all the work you've done over the years. It's very nice to meet you. And uh, uh, dare I say, it was listening to you that got me all into this a little bit. And uh, but you know, that's good few years ago. So. <laughs> oh <my goodness. laughs>